right, students, this is Dr. Shell, and we're going to be talking about categorical arguments now. So you have already watched the lecture on being a Venn master, and then you've watched the lecture about categorical statements. Then what we can do is we can take these categorical statements, A, E, I, and O, and combine them, and we can make an argument. Uh, and each argument contains three statements. Uh, the first two are premises, and the third one is the conclusion that the person who's constructing the argument says that if A and B, right, then will lead to C. And uh, when you take those pieces of the A, E, I, and O and configure them uh, according to categorical structure, uh, there are exactly 256 possible combinations only 24 of those are valid. So knowing how to construct a categorical argument, how to recognize if one is invalid so that you can discount it if somebody tries to use it on you, and then knowing how to evaluate so that you can um, learn them. Now, there's a couple of options. You could weigh, you could learn all two, uh, 256 of them, or you could master the 24 valid forms, or you can learn the four rules that I'm going to discuss in this lecture, and using those four rules, you can evaluate any and all categorical arguments. So I have constructed it in this little um, diagram that I call categorical pizza, and I have used um, soda and M&M and pizza uh, to illustrate um, categorical arguments because you need a, um, a P and an S and an M, and there's just so many ways that you can arrange them. And so I use them uh, to sort of be the, the example so that you know what you're plugging in and where it goes. All right, so here we go. Um, all pizzas are from Papa John's. All the students are eating pizza. All the students are eating Papa John's. Um, this is a classic categorical argument. Um, you've actually seen this one before. It's called an AAA1. Um, and um, we're going to learn what that means, but you need to see that what we have here are three categorical statements. In this case, they all happen to be A statements. And the argument is saying that if A is true and if B is true, then C is has to be true. But rather than saying A, B, and C, we actually have more technical terms uh, for all of this, and we need to sort of master all these terms so we know uh, what we're talking about. And so here's how we uh, differentiate these statements. So the one that we would say is on top is called the major premise. The second line is called the minor premise, and the third line is called the conclusion. And this has become very, very important later because there are rules about what has to be in the major premise, in the minor premise, and in the conclusion, and what their relationships are for you to decide if they are valid or not. So in this case, all the pizzas are from Papa John's is the major premise. So imagine uh, we're having a, an event at, uh, on the campus and we've ordered a bunch of pizza. All the pizza came from Papa John's. That's the major premise. The minor premise is all the students are eating pizza. So there they are. You see a bunch, all the students have a piece of pizza in their hand. Then the conclusion is that all the students are eating Papa John's. Okay, so we have a major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. So I have designed this little uh, diagram, and I kind of think of it as a, as a mixed metaphor. So maybe think of it like a parking lot. So there's only six spaces on this parking lot. There's only six places you can possibly put a car. And there are three kinds of cars. There are S, P, and M. And I use soda and pizza and M&Ms. So the conclusion of your argument is always in this formation. The S is the first term and the P is the second term. So S and P always have to be like this. Okay, so whatever somebody, when they make an argument, they come to the conclusion, the first part is the uh, 
the S and the second part is the P. Always has to be this way. It never fails in an exam or a quiz. I will reverse these and somebody will get it wrong. This is free money because of the six parking spots, these two are designated. The, the one on the left is for soda and the one on the right is for the pizza. And of course, it's, it's more, a little more technical than that. So why is this important to know where the S and the P go? Ah, the second term of the conclusion, the one that's in the right-hand position, is called the major term. The pizza is the major term. And the major term has to be in the major premise. We've already talked about the major premise is the one on top. So the, the, the right-hand term the pizza, has to be in the first line. Now, it could be in either position, the right or the left, but it has to be in the top line. If it's not in the top line, you don't have an argument. You have a hot mess. Okay, So uh, we have major premise, minor premise, conclusion, and the major term is in the conclusion, and it has to be in the major premise. And surprise, surprise, the term that's on the left-hand side of the conclusion, the soda position, the S position, is called the minor term. And you guessed it, the minor term must be in the minor premise, the second line. So the minor term has to be somewhere in the second line. You've got two choices, right or left, but it has to be in that minor term premise. If you don't, you don't have an argument. You just have a hot mess. Okay. Uh, if, if the major term or the minor term are missing in your argument, then you don't have an argument. You can only have three terms, a subject, a predicate, and a middle term. That's all you can have. You can only have three terms. Uh, and if there's anything else in the argument, uh, you don't have an argument. You have a mess. So uh, minor term goes in the minor premise. And the major term goes in the major premise. Now, that brings us to the M&Ms. The M&Ms are the middle terms. And the middle term is what actually links the argument together, right? We, we said before, all the pizza was from Papa John's. All the students were eating pizza. Therefore, all the students were eating Papa John's. That middle term of uh, the pizza, um, it serves as the middle term in, in that scenario. So I use the M and M's here. Now, there has to be an M in the major premise. There has to be an M in the minor premise. Notice there cannot be an M in the conclusion. If there's an M in the conclusion, you don't have an argument. You have a hot mess. Okay. So between the P and the M, and the, M and the soda and the M&M, and the pizza and the M&M, they can go in two different positions, right? Either right and left. So uh, now there's like, now the parking is getting really tight here because on the top row, pizza goes in one slot and the M goes in another slot. And the second row, the soda goes in one slot, the M&M goes in the other slot. Soda and pizza always have the same position in the conclusion. So it just becomes now a question of who's going into which parking spot. And it turns out that there's only four ways this works out. So let's go back to our very popular AAA1. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about where the one comes from. But notice here now, we have included the major premise, the minor premise, the conclusion, and we've inserted the uh, copla. Remember from our earlier discussion, the copla is that middle term, the R, or the R naught, if in case. And then we have the quantifiers. In this case, they're all, all, all. It could be no, it could be some, it could be some or not. In this case, they're all A uh, arguments. That's why it's called A, A, A. And the M and M's are in the one position. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But this is how you sort of break it down. You lay it out like this. You put the M and M's in their parking spots. You fill it in with the major term, the minor term. 
which are drawn from the conclusion. And this is how it, you construct it. It looks just like this. So uh, you may want to sort of play around with this and sort of become comfortable with sort of um, picking a letter combination and then creating the argument to see to make sure you understand how to manipulate those pieces. But in an AAA1, you have S and P in the bottom. You have M. All M's are P's. All S's are M's. Therefore, all S's are P. All uh, men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Sophie, all uh, minifigs are plastic. Sophie is a minifig. Therefore, Sophie is plastic. Okay, so that's the classic AAA argument, and this is how it gets built out in logic book form. Okay, so that, that the name of this argument, the AAA1, those letters and numbers are telling us something. They're giving us some information. So the letters tell us the mood of the argument. Yeah, I don't know why it's called the mood. It's like, I'm in the mood. I don't know. Uh, but it's called the mood. And the mood is really just the combination of letters that correspond with the letters of the arguments. So this is an AAA -A -A argument. It, the mood is AAA -A -A because all three, major premise, minor premise and conclusion are all A statements. If they were all E statements, then the mood would be E, E, E. Okay? Or if there was uh, an E and an I and an O, it would be Old MacDonald. E, I, E, I, O. Right? And uh, good news, E, I, E, I, O arguments are always valid in all four um, figures. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But when we discuss the mood, that's what those three letters are telling you. Those three letters are telling you what three um, statements are being used. An E statement, an I statement, an O statement, an A statement. And that's telling you how it's configured. And it's always telling you in that order. Major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. All right, so now we have our mood straight. Now let's talk about that little number, AAA1. That is called the figure. And um, it's not telling you that the argument is, has an attractive figure or an unattractive figure. The figure is telling you the position of the M terms. Okay, so there are four possibilities. Therefore, guess what? There are four figures. So if you're keeping up, there are of the AAA moods, they can be in four figures. One, two, three, and four. A A A one, A A A two, A A A three, A A A four. The only one that's valid is one. Now we're going to talk about why, and you'll be able to know that. You could just learn it, uh, or you can learn the rules. But uh, that number tells you the figures. So I'm going to look. We're going to go through the four possibilities for the figures. Okay. So figure one. It has to do with the position of the middle terms. And in a figure one, the, uh, in the major premise, the middle term is on the left. And in the minor premise, the middle term is on the right. So they move this way. And I've, I've been trying to figure out how to uh, say it. So if somebody has a brilliant idea, you could let me know. So anyway, but it moves from top to bottom top left to bottom right. That's figure one. And it has to do with where the middle terms are. Now, remember, it's a parking lot. So if the middle terms are arranged this way, there's only one place you can put the pizza because the pizza has to be on the top line. But since the M is already in its parking spot, it only leaves the right top for the pizza and the same thing with the soda. The soda can only go in the second line. There's only one spot left. That's why you have to do the middle term first. If you're building an argument uh, or if you're analyzing an argument, the most important thing is to figure out which where are the middle terms. Because once the middle terms are in place, the other ones have to fall into place for it to be valid. Okay, figure two. 
the M&Ms are lined up on the right-hand side, one over top of the other. Okay, so in the major premise, the M is on the right. In the minor premise, I mean, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the middle term is on the right. And therefore, it leaves only one place. You can possibly put the pizza. There's only one place to put the soda. So a figure two has the middle terms lined up uh, on the right-hand side of the statement. Remember, these are statements. And then uh, the argument is constructed from combining three of these statements. Okay, and so figure three has the middle terms lined up on the left-hand side. Uh, and so all in, in, if it was an A, 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 three, it would be all M's are P, right? Because it has to be a P. The second line would be all M's are S's because the S and the P have to go in those positions. So once we know where M is parked, there's only one place left for soda to go. There's only one place left for pizza to go. And feeling like a broken record, uh, number four, figure four, has the M's in the opposite angles. Again, this time going from top right to bottom left. So uh, this is the construction of the middle term in a figure four argument. So uh, in this case, it would be all P's are M, all M's are S's, okay? So that's how, because again, once the middle term is in place, you know where the pizza and the soda have to go. Okay, so we're going to try to build an EIO3 argument, an EIO3 argument. So the, what you want to do, first of all, is figure out where are the M&Ms parked. Remember, that's the figure part. Okay, The EIO is the mood, and 3 is the figure. So we want to first figure out where are we going to put the Ms. So I want you to take a moment before we move on, pause this thing, and figure out where you're going to put the Ms. You can draw it and take a moment and draw this out, and then pause this, and then return once you have made your, made your attempt. Okay, so I hope you have something that looks like this. The M's are lined up on the left-hand side of the major and the minor premise because the three has the M's on the left. Two has the M's on the right. One, they go top, right, top left, bottom right. And four, they go top right, bottom left. So this is the way a three figure is constructed. Now, let's see if we can figure out where to put the P and where to put the S, okay? So remember, the M's are already in the parking spot. So now we gotta figure out what to do with the S and the P. So pause this, write in where you think S and P go, and we'll come back on the other side. Okay, so is this what you have? Um, if it is a three argument, the M's have to line up on the left, the major term has to be in the major premise, so it's the P, the pizza, so the pizza has to go in the top right. And the soda, which is the minor term, has to go in the minor premise. There's only one place for it to go. It has to go right there. So if you didn't get that right, you better go back and listen to this again and make sure you understand why that's the case because you're going to have to do this in the exam. You're going to have to be able to recognize them and build them. So make sure you understand how that happened. Now we're going to talk about the mood. Okay, so the mood is the which statement is in which position. So we have an EIO3. We've already set up the structure of the mood of the figure because we got the, the M's and the P's in the right place. Now we have to turn them into the correct mood. So you have to fill in the rest of it. All S is RP, no S is RP, like that. So I'm going to want you to pause it. I want you to um, fill in the rest of the argument based on which categorical statement is being mine. Which The first line is an E. Write out what an E is. Okay. 
uh, and then the next one is an I, and the next one is an O. So fill out that just like we did earlier, and then uh, rejoin me on the other side of that. So this is what it looks like. An EIO3 starts out with an E statement in the major premise. No M's are P's. No M's are P's. How do I know that? I know it because an E statement is in the form of no blanks are blank. Okay, but I've already filled in the blank because the three told me where the middle term has to go. And once I put the middle terms in place, there's only one place to put the subject and there's only one place to put the predicate. So no M's are P's. The second one is an I statement. The I statement is some S's are P. But there's already an M in place, so some M's are S's. And then the last one, we you know, the last statement is an O. And that takes the form of some are not. So now we have our S and a P have to be in this position. Some S's are not P. Okay, so there you are. That's the form of a categorical argument EIO3. That's what it looks like because you've built it based on the correct figure. You've then filled in the mood and now you can analyze the actual argument to see if you think it's true, if it's but it is structurally correct. Now we have to find out is it valid so by manipulating the three terms, the S, the P, and the M, into the different moods and the different figures, that's where you come up with the, the possibility of 256 possible combinations, right? Because there's an AAA1, 2, 3, 4, there's an EIO, there's an OIE, there's an EEE. -E. I mean, you could see every single one of those has multiple ways that you can reconfigure them. And then they each have four potential figures. So that gets to be a lot to, to work with. How do I know if it's valid or not? So there are, as I said, a couple ways you could do it. One, you could memorize them all. The next thing you could do is you could memorize these 24. Or you can just use this chart. Um, so this chart shows you the 24 valid arguments. They're the only ones. Now, some are called unconditionally valid. Some are called conditionally valid. We're not going to go into that. That has to do with the difference between Aristotle and Boolean. And that is for advanced logic. And so don't worry about it. You just need to be un understand that there are these 24 valid forms. That's all there are. Okay, so as you look at it, if you have, you could look at this, and if you have an AAA1 argument, you go to this, and it's easiest to look at the figures first. So you look down that the one column, and you say, is AAA a valid form in figure one? And yes, indeed it is. But what about AAA3? You go to the third column, you look down, and you look, is there an AAA3? No, it's not. So AAA3 is invalid, and you don't have to listen to it. So knowing how to work this chart, once you know the, um, the mood and the figure of an argument, you then can go to this handy-dandy chart and look to see if it is represented in the chart. Now, I, can, I can hear the howl of protest already, and you're saying, Dr. Shell, Am I supposed to carry this chart around with me in my wallet, in my purse for the rest of my life? Um, well, no. Of course, uh, these days with smartphones, you could take a picture of it, or you could just get it off the internet anytime you need it. Um, but um, there's even an easier way, which is to learn the four rules that apply to any argument. And then you will understand if it's valid or invalid. You'll know why. Uh, and plus, that's what a lot you know. students will always say, well, how do I know why are those 24 valid and all the other possibilities? There's 256 possible combinations. How come so many are invalid and only those 24 are valid? 
Well, I'm going to explain that to you. So the first thing we have to master is this idea called distribution, distributed. Um, and it's a little wonky, a little complicated. Um, I would suggest that rather than try to really understand it, you just sort of accept it, <laughs> just sort of take it. This is one of those times where it's probably just easier to memorize it, and then um, you'll you'll be able to roll with it. Um, if, if it doesn't make any sense to you, you certainly can do some other research, look it up, and get a better description of it. Um, but we need to discuss what it means for a term to be distributed. So any categorical statement is either um, each term in a categorical statement is either distributed or undistributed. Okay, so in a all S R P, we have two terms, an S and a P, and they are either distributed or undistributed. And knowing which is and which isn't is really important to understand how it has uh, implications for being valid or invalid. The simplest way to sort of understand what do I mean when I say distributed, in those four categorical statements, A, E, I, and O, they are saying something, uh, well, if they are saying something about every possible item, term, then it is being distributed. If they are not saying anything about every possible uh, term, then it's not distributed. Okay, so if it's talking about the entire class, then the term is distributed. If it's not talking about the entire class, then it is undistributed. Okay, so the easiest thing to understand, for example, is an an uh, an E statement. No S's are P. Actually, distributes both um, the subject and the predicate. It distributes both terms because it's saying that they have no connection. Okay, if I say no Skittles are poisonous, I am saying something about all the Skittles, all every single Skittle in the planet, and I'm saying something about every single poisonous thing in the planet, and that is they never meet. So in that case, the subject and the predicate, the P and the S, are both distributed in an E statement. Okay, I'm saying something about everything in the class. Okay, so here we are. Here's our four categorical statements. And in those statements, the terms, either the subject or the predicate, right, the S or the P, the soda or the pizza, is distributed. And you need to learn this. You need to master this. Um, I have been trying for years to come up with a clever, creative way to remember it, and I got nothing. I use the little thing at the bottom of the of the uh, the slide there, the uh, as eb in op, as in op, which that doesn't help at all. But that's the best I got. So if somebody out there is more creative or clever than me, please tell me a way to turn that into something that a, a, an average person could actually remember. But let's go. An A statement distributes the subject, okay? So when I said before that um, all minifigs are plastic, now I'm not saying anything about all the plastics, right? That's the P term, that's the predicate term. There's, we already said there's lots of different kinds of things that are made out of plastic. But I am saying something about the entire class of minifigs the subject of that statement and that they are all in the plastic category. So you see I'm saying something about every minifig. So uh, all people are mortals. I'm saying something about all people. They are all mortal. Now there's other things that are mortal, you know, donkeys, but they're not people. Um, so an A statement distributes the subject. An E statement distributes both. I already talked about that, right? Skittles and poisonous things. No Skittles are poisonous. I'm saying that, that I'm saying something about all the S's and all the P's, which is they are not connected. 
Okay, so that's why it distributes both because it's saying something about both of them. Now, an I statement it distributes neither. That's why it's I N. An I statement doesn't distribute anything because it's not saying anything about an entire class, right? Some S's are P. Okay, so some S's are P. Um, I'm not saying anything about all the S's. I'm not saying anything about all the P's. I'm just saying some of them are one or the other. So that doesn't distribute anything. Um, it really doesn't tell you very much at all. And, and that's why we get in trouble with I, I statements and arguments. So uh, remember that's particularly uh, affirmative. So uh, I distributes nothing, neither. The O distributes the predicate. Now, this one is kind of hard to explain, so just roll with it. When I say uh, no S's are P, I'm saying something about all the P's, and that is none of them are S's. Okay, So whatever S is, I don't know what it is, but it's not a P. So I'm saying something about all the predicates, and that is that none of them are in the S category. Okay. But I'm, I'm not saying anything about all the S's. I'm just saying something about all the P's. Um, so if I say some students are not present, I'm saying something about the present, right? Uh, all of the, the being present is a class of people, and some students are not in it. I don't know anything else about the students, but all I know is that some of them are not present, so I know some. All I know is about the present class, um, so it, it makes it, it's hard to explain. So just roll with it. So you just need to learn this: that uh, that uh, an A distributes the subject, the uh, E distributes both, the I distributes neither, and the O distributes the predicate. Now, I, yeah, I can hear you. I hear you cursing at. Uh, out loud, you're 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 on your uh, treadmill in the gym there, and you're screaming because you're listening to this on your uh, your earbuds there, and uh, you're like, Doctor Shell, so what? Who cares about the distribution? Ah, because because we don't want to learn 256 possible arguments. We don't even want to learn 24 arguments. We want to learn four rules. But to understand the four rules, we have to understand the power of distribution because that's what is the linchpin of being able to determine if a statement, if an argument is valid. Okay, These four rules have to do with what's being distributed. Okay, uh, is, it, is anything distributed in the conclusion? We need to know that. Okay, So, uh, if the conclusion is an I statement, we know nothing's distributed. That has ramifications. If it's an A statement, we know that the subject is distributed. That has ramifications for the rules. So to understand the rules, you have to understand distribution. So before we go on any further and talk about the rules, if you're not clear on distribution, go back and listen to that again to make sure you understand what is being distributed in each of those individual statements. Because then when you string them into an argument, they have implications that you, we need to know what is distributed and what is not. Okay, rule number one. The middle term must be distributed at least once. So in the argument, right, within the major term and the minor, I mean, major premise and minor premise, there's going to be a middle term, right? And it's either in a one, two, three, or four position. But somewhere in here, the middle term has to be distributed. Okay? So, uh, in this uh, argument, all sharks are fish, all hammerheads are sharks, therefore all hammerheads are fish. Okay? This is, uh, you should know by now, an AAA1 because sharks is the middle term and the sharks is in the one position, right? Top, top left, bottom right. Now, in order for it to pass muster here, the middle term has to be distributed once. An A statement distributes, say it with me, the subject. That's the first term. So, 
in the major premise, all sharks are fish. Sharks is in the first position. Okay, so in a, a statements distributes the subject. The subject of that line is sharks, and it is distributed. So it passes. Ding, ding, ding. So uh, we pass. It passes. Now let's look at the second line. All hammerheads are sharks. Okay, in this minor premise, the subject is hammerheads. They're in the first position. All hammerheads are sharks. In this case, what's being distributed is hammerheads, not the middle term, sharks. But that's okay because it was distributed in the first line. So since the first line distributes the middle term, then this passes rule number one. Now, remember the conclusion. The middle term can't be in the conclusion. If the middle term is in the conclusion, you don't have an argument. In this case, sharks is in the major premise. It's in the minor premise. It is not in the conclusion. And if you want to just keep keep up, remember that um, in the looking at the conclusion, that Fish is in the pizza slot, and it has to be in the first line. Hammerheads is in the soda shop, the soda slot. It has to be in the second line, and sure enough, there, there they are. So sharks is in the M&M &M position. That's the number one uh, uh, figure. They're in their parking spots, and the fish and hammerheads fall into, into, into line there. So I hear you saying, well, Shell, what happens if they're not in the right place? Okay, here is a fallacy called an undistributed middle. Now, it's deceptive because it looks like an AAA argument. All sharks are fish. All salmon are fish. The conclusion then comes out, all salmon are sharks, which is not right. Now, in this case, it's obvious because you know that salmon are not sharks. But what happens if somebody's using a categorical argument about something you you don't know as much about, say buying a car or uh, about some sort of medical procedure, and you don't know right from just looking at the conclusion that you don't know if the conclusion is valid. That's why knowing the form and figure and mood of the argument is so important. So this has an undistributed middle. Let's look at it. This is actually, let's see if you can figure it out. This is an AAA argument also, but it's not an AAA1. It's an AAA, hmm, what is it? Ah, it's a two. And we could look up on the chart and it would tell us that there is no AAA in the figure two uh, house. The Middle Ages, the monks used to think of them as houses, the four houses. And actually they came up with clever little names for all the initials, A-A-A, E-I-O, and they were all women's names too. I don't know why, but uh, at any rate, uh, A-A-A does not live in house number two. Um, so even if I didn't know off the top of my head that the conclusion was false, by looking at the distribution, I can tell that this is an invalid argument, okay? So in the major premise, all sharks are fish, Sharks are not, the sharks are distributed. In the second line, the minor premise, salmon are distributed. But the middle term is fish, and it's not distributed in either the major premise or the minor premise. So if the fish are not distributed and they're the middle term, we have an invalid argument. It fails by what is called an undistributed middle. There you go. So that's rule number one. The middle term has to be distributed at least once. So you need to know which is the middle term and you need to know your rules of distribution in order to apply rule number one. Okay, rule number two. If a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the premise. If it's distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the premise. Okay, so uh, all soldiers are patriots. No soldiers, no traitors are patriots. Therefore, no traitors are soldiers. 
Okay. Um, let's see. First of all, we have to know what is the name of this argument. So what is its um, what's its mood? All, no, and no. So this is an A, E, E. What position is the middle term? The middle term is patriots. Notice they're lined up right there for you. They're in the two position. So this is an A, E, E, two. Now, is it valid? Well, you could memorize them all. You could pull up your handy dandy chart, or you can see, let's apply the rule. First of all, the first rule we had was that the, um, the middle term has to be distributed at least once. Okay, the major premise, all soldiers are patriots, and A distributes the uh, subject, which is soldiers. So that doesn't work because patriots is not distributed. But in the second line, no traitors are patriots. In an E statement, it distributes both the subject and the predicate. So traitors and patriots are both distributed, and we need the middle term distributed at least once. And bada boom, bada bing, it is. Now, in the conclusion, both traitors and soldiers are distributed because it is an E statement. Traitors is distributed and soldiers is distributed. So to pass rule number two, both of those terms have to be distributed. We already discovered that traitor is distributed in the minor premise. Now soldiers is up in the major premise. And it is an A statement. It distributes the subject. Soldiers is in the subject position. So soldiers are also distributed. So boom, bada boom, it passes rule number one and rule number two. So here's what rule number two looks like when it's violated. This is called an illicit major or an illicit minor, which sounds like a terrible crime to commit. Um, an illicit major or illicit minor means that Something isn't distributed properly. It depends whether it's in the major term or the minor term. Okay, so if it's distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the, um, in the premise. So in the conclusion, all dogs are not animals, which is false, but let's just go with it. All dogs are not animals. I guess maybe some dogs might be stuffed. I don't know. Um, not all, some are not, is an O statement. An O statement distributes the predicate, the second term. In this case, it's animals. So for this to be a valid argument, animals has to be distributed. Because it's the major term, it's only in the major premise. All horses are animals, which is true. Um, but animals is not distributed. It's an A statement. A distributes the subject. Horses is distributed, but not animals. Okay, horses is the middle term. It's distributed in the major term. It's also distributed in the minor term. So it passes that test that it does distribute the minor. I mean, the middle term is distributed, but it fails test number two because the conclusion has a term, animals, that's distributed it's not distributed in the premise. And again, I use these very simple examples. You know some dogs are not animals is not a valid argument. You know that's wrong. But again, when people are talking foreign policy, when people are talking uh, relationships, medical terms, um, it may not be obvious to you that the conclusion uh, doesn't follow from the premise because you don't know that you don't know the subject. Maybe you're not a master of the subject, but you do know that if the if something's distributed in the conclusion and it's not distributed in the premise, then it is an invalid argument. It goes on the dump heap of those 256 minus 24 uh, that are invalid. You toss it away. It's no good. So next is rule number three, which is you cannot have two negative premises. Uh, that's just not allowed. If you take this argument, the middle term is distributed, so it passes rule number one. The uh, term in the conclusion, mammals, is distributed in the um, 
premise so that it passes rule number two, but it fails rule number three. And if you were to sort of draw this on a Venn diagram, this is saying that no fish are mammals. So you have a circle that represents mammals, you have a circle that represents fish, and there's nothing, they don't overlap at all. Okay, so remember our one that said no Skittles are poisonous. So the S and the P are completely separate. But then you introduce dogs into the equation. And it says some dogs are not fish. So you're now saying that dogs are outside the fish circle. But you haven't actually said wh where do the dogs belong. So you have a circle that's mammals, a circle that's fish, and the dogs that are not in the fish circle. But you haven't demonstrated that the dogs are in the mammals circle. So you have just two negative premises that essentially don't show any connection between the two of them. And so it fails uh, line rule number three. And rule number four is that if you have a negative premise, then the conclusion must also be negative. Or vice versa, if you have a negative conclusion, it requires that there be a negative premise. Only one negative premise, right? Two negative premises fails rule number three. But if there is a premise that is negative, that means the conclusion will then have to be negative. It's sort of like multiplying times a negative number. If you remember that stuff from math class, so that once there's a negative in the, the equation, it requires that the conclusion be negative. Uh, all crows are birds, and some wolves are not crows. Therefore, some wolves are birds. Uh, doesn't work because you have introduced a negative premise, but you, you've tried to produce a positive um, conclusion, and that doesn't work. If there's a negative in the premise, then the conclusion also has to be negative. So uh, you can't draw a positive statement once you've introduced a negative premise. Now I'm going to give you an opportunity to, um, to practice. So here is a, an, a good old argument, a categorical argument. All teen suicides are tragic occurrences. No tragic occurrences are heroic, ep heroic episodes. Therefore, no heroic episodes are teenage suicides. So what I want you to do is pause this video, get out a piece of paper and pencil, and work this out. What is the mood of this argument? What is the form of this argument? I mean, the figure. Um, and therefore, from that, you can decide, is it valid or not? Okay, so stop the video. I'm serious. Stop it. Get a piece of paper out, because you're going to need to be able to do this on the exam. Uh, what is the mood, figure, and is it valid? So pause this, and when you restart, I assume that you're ready to look at uh, compare our answers. Okay, we're back. So I assume that you came to the conclusion that this is an A, E, E, 4. Okay, and I have lined this out for you. So the first statement is an A. All T suicides are tragic occurrences. So that's an A, all. The next line, no tragic occurrences are heroic episodes. No, so that's an E. The last one is uh, no heroic episodes are teenage suicides. So that is also an E statement. So let's see, does it follow our rules? First rule is that the middle term must be distributed. The middle term is tragic occurrences. I've highlighted it here so you can see it occurs in both lines. And lo and behold, uh, it is not distributed in the first line. That's an A statement. It distributes the, pr the predicate, I mean the, uh, the subject. In the second line, the E statement distributes both the predicate and the subject. In this case, the subject is tragic occurrences. That is our middle term. So it is distributed at least once. That's all it needs. Number two, if it is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the premise. This is an E statement. It distributes both. So is heroic episodes distributed? Yes, it's in the second line. Heroic episodes. And E distributes both. So heroic episodes is distributed in the premise to the minor premise, and teenage suicides needs to be distributed. 
It is. It's distributed in the major premise. It is the subject of the major premise in, in the first line. So it passes rule number one. It passes rule number two. Rule number three, you cannot have two negative premises. We have one negative. We have one positive. Check a root. And if there is a negative premise, there must be a negative conclusion. And bada boom, bada bing, it works. So since it passes all four of our tests, then we can conclude that an AEE4 is in fact a valid argument. Now we can double check ourselves against the old chart to see if it works. So let's look at the chart and see if in house four, AEE -E is in fact a valid argument. And sure enough, there it is. In house number four, figure four, AEE -E is a valid argument. Now, we know it's valid because we ran it through the four test, but this is a good way to sort of double check yourself so that you not only see that it's on the chart, but you understand why it's on the chart. Great. All right, let's try a couple more. So the next two, I want you to work at home. So here I am in my home little office, and I want you to um, take these two, write them down, uh, work them out on your own, decide which um, argument they are, give them their proper name, and decide whether they are valid and invalid. And after you have watched this um, in a day or two on uh, our, our classroom site, I will post the answers. And if you have any questions, you can see me uh, during my office hour. So glad you watched this. I know this was uh, lengthy, but I think if you walked your way through this, you'll be in good shape as you try to analyze uh, categorical arguments and you'll be ready for the exam and you'll be ready for the assignments based on this material. So this is Dr. Shell, sauntering on.